In this tutorial, we're going to perform an optimization example with NAS Trans Solution 200. Uh, I believe this example is focused on a frequency response analysis. My name is Christian Aparicio, and I will be walking you through today's tutorial. So here, this example rather is from the MSC NAS Trend Design Sensitivity and Optimization User's Guide. Uh, you'll find this example in Chapter 8. Uh, titled dynamic response optimization now what's going on here is that we have this uh, plate if you will that's going to be subjected to a frequency dependent load uh, we want to monitor what the response is specifically what the displacement response is uh, for grid 1110 by the end of this video what we want to do is minimize the response at that node for the given set of loading or forcing frequencies that you see here. So by the end, this is what we're going to do. We are going to take the root mean square of displacement at that node, 11110. Uh, the RMS displacement uh, at the very beginning or initial design is 15.2. Uh, after we're done optimizing this model, we find that the new RMS displacement is 11.3, so it has been minimized. Uh, one requirement is that we keep the volume of this plate almost at the same original value of 8 uh, units of volume. And the one thing we are going to let vary is the thickness of each zone, if you will. So here you can see that at the beginning, each thickness is constant. But after the optimization, after all the thicknesses are varied, you can see we have this tapering effect throughout the plate. As a result of the optimization, as our goal is specified, uh, by minimizing the RMS value, we actually minimize the displacement response across the forcing frequencies that you see here. So here in solid red line is the original response, and here in dotted line is the new optimized response. Now, before I go ahead and get started, um, if it's worth it, actually, I'm not sure how, how useful it would be to go over the structural model. I'll make a few comments regarding that. Then I'll go over the optimization problem statement. Uh, this is a summary of all the things you want to vary in your finite element model. Then uh, we'll have a discussion on what our objective is and what the constraints are. How do we explicitly define these for NASTRAN Solution 200? We'll perform the optimization with NASTRAN. And then towards the end, we'll go ahead and look at the results, um, just so we all are on the same page with that. And then at the end, uh, I'll walk you through the process of updating the original plate with the updated thicknesses um, for the optimized solution. Uh, before I get started, a quick reminder, if you are a professional engineer and you're interested in training or have a question regarding NAS Trans Solution 200, uh, you can send me an email at this address and I would be more than glad to uh, have an answer ready for you. If you're a student or professional engineer, you can get access to today's web app, uh, which allows you to set up NAS Trans Solution 200. So now let's go ahead and get started. and have a brief discussion regarding the model. Uh, we are only going to evaluate or focus on just a half portion of the finite element model. Uh, we are going to make use of symmetry, so we don't have, have to actually uh, simulate the entire plate. You can imagine there's a, a line of symmetry here. So here, this is my center line. Uh, so we are only going to uh, evaluate uh, this half of the plate and here on this side of the screen we have that half section of the plate uh, these ends that you see me highlight with the red line are clamped uh, we have symmetry constraints here on this middle line uh, this is the node of focus this is where we're looking at the displacement for all of those four state frequencies and uh, you can see where our pressure distribution is and uh, one quick note, this end is free as I uh, define it here with the label. Uh, here, just as a reminder, this is the displacement result response for this node, node uh, 1110. 
uh, for the given set of forcing frequencies. So remember, our goal is to minimize this curve as much as possible. And the, re the way we're going to do that, rather, we're going to minimize the RMS value, if you will. So now let's go ahead and talk about the optimization problem statement. This problem statement is a requirement before you start optimization. It's a summary of three components. The first one being uh, your design variables. Oh, that was supposed to be a one. What we're going to do is say that the thickness of zone one will be design variable x1. Zone 2 will be design variable x2 for thickness 2, and so on and so on, until we get to the end where uh, thickness 10 will be design variable x10. Uh, we are going to let the thicknesses vary between 0 0.01 and 1. And now what about our objective and our constraints? This finite element model and any finite element model is going to generate a large volume of quantities or responses or outputs. Uh, some quantities can be displacements, they can be strains, they can be stresses, and so on and so on. What's special about this optimization example is that our results are going to be uh, available for a range of frequencies. So now let's talk about the second component of the optimization problem statement. Uh, this should have been a two. Number two, the design objective. Uh, we want to minimize this displacement curve for node 1110. So how do we do that? Uh, the objective should always be one single quantity. But if you look here at the curve, when you perform your analysis, you actually get data for each forcing frequency. So how do you express this curve in terms of one quantity? This is where you take advantage of this RMS expression that you see here. Uh, basically, what we are going to do is take um, each point, and we're going to use this function to come up with a single uh, value epsilon, if, if that's what the Greek letter is, and we are going to minimize this epsilon term. Uh, in terms of our constraints, this is the third component of the optimization problem statement. We are going to say that the volume should be between 7.99 and 8.01. Uh, the goal here is to keep the volume very close to a value of 8. So here is a snapshot of my entire uh, how do I say, uh, problem statement, we're going to go ahead and use this to go through the process of setting this up for NAS Translution 200. Uh, the first thing you're going to need is the BDF file. Uh, you may be doing an example of your own. Uh, here I have Patron open. I've already gone ahead and, how do I say, constructed the model, I've already evaluated, I've performed my frequency response analysis, and here on the right I have my results. Uh, if I look in the same folder, I can see that I have the BDF file that contains the entire finite element model, uh, the grids, the loading, the properties such as the material and the thicknesses, that's all in this one single file. This file has to now be updated and converted to Solution 200. If you want to follow along with this example, the starting file BDF can be found in the user's guide. If we refer to the tutorial section, specifically the size optimization tutorials, you'll find this example, dynamic response optimization. If you right click on the starting BDF file, this BDF file is the same one that we are going to use for this example. So feel free to download this file and follow along. So now, after you have this first BDF file, you then use the web app to perform this conversion. This is where you're going to define your variables for the thicknesses, your objective expression, and your constraints. Uh, after this, we're going to perform the optimization with NASTRAN. We're going to look at the results. And then uh, I'll go through step four at the very end. So now let's go ahead and start with the conversion process. We'll go ahead and open the web app. And this is where I'll go ahead and import this BDF file. We can now begin the process of converting it. I'll find the thickness. 
And here what you can do is filter the list by T to only show thickness. You can click one of these plus icons to set that property as a design variable. Uh, here I want to set the thickness to range between 0 0.01 and 1. And then I have to repeat the process for these other uh, nine thicknesses. If you click on options, you can automatically generate, or rather, you can automatically select all of these thick, uh, visible properties and set them as uh, design variables. So here, what I'll do is I'll specify that I want balance of 0 0.01 and 1. And then once I click on this create icon, notice that all of these plus icons have been set automatically for me. If I look at the next table, you can see all of these thicknesses have been set as design variables for me. So this is a time saver capability that was worth mentioning. Let's go ahead and move on to defining our objective. Now here, what we want to do is specify our expression for the RMS value that you see here. Or here, I believe we're not focusing on the RMS value. We are focusing on the root sum of squares. Let me see if uh, I can track down where that mistake was. So I believe earlier in the presentation, I was saying that the RMS displacement should be minimized. Uh, here, just to quickly augment this, uh, we are also focusing, or rather, we're are instead focusing on the root sum of squares. So how do you how do you program this into Nastran as an objective? So the first thing we want to do is go to the objective section and in this list look for this displacement also known as FR disp. Set that as the objective. And for the displacement component, let's go ahead and see what we have here. I believe we want to do this for the Z component. So here we'll go ahead and set this as the third or Z component. And we want this to be for all frequencies and this is going to be for node 1110. So here keep in mind what R0 represents. R0 represents, let me see if I can find a good uh, screen here. R0 represents every displacement response for each forcing frequency. So R0 is actually going to have each point that I'm plotting here. So R0 could potentially have 100 values associated with it. Um, so um, it really depends on how many forcing frequencies you've defined. Uh, so here, one, two, three, four, five, six. I've only, as an example, put six. Uh, values here, but if you keep up uh, putting points here, you can see that uh, R0 is really representing multiple values. So maybe instead of 100, I should say multiple values. Remember that the objective should always be one single value. So one single value. So now you can see we have a conflict. R0 is representing multiple values but we need to express it as a single value. This, the way we are going to do this is by using an RSS function or the root sum of squares. So let's go ahead and jump out of this and go through how to do that. Uh, so instead of saying all frequencies here, uh, remember our or all frequencies represents every point here on this curve, we'll go ahead and set this to RSS. So this is going to consume all of those points on the curve and it's going to compute the RSS value. We'll go ahead and say that we want to minimize this single RSS value and that completes the creation of the objective. Let's go ahead and specify our constraints. We want to say that the volume should be, t be between 7.99 and 8.01. After this, we can go to the exporter and click on option one to download our new package, we'll go ahead and extract the contents, and then we'll double click this desktop icon, start MSC Nastran, and this will start the optimization. It's important to note that in this directory are two files. The first file is the model BDF file. This is the converted version of your original BDF file. So here, 
Here's the original BDF file. You'll see that it's currently set to solution 111. Uh, here I switched to the model BDF file. It's now solution 200. It's out of statements for the optimization also. Uh, the second file of importance is the design model. This contains statements for all of your 10 design variables as uh, information regarding the design objective and your design constraints here. Uh, after the optimization is complete, uh, the results should be automatically uploaded for you. Uh, this is where we can go ahead and start looking at our results. So here we see that the RSS value at the very beginning was 15.19 units of length. At the end, we ended off at a new uh, RSS value of 11.30. Let's go ahead and scroll down to the variables. Each thickness was originally constant, so it was a flat 0.08 units of length for the thickness. But the, then here at the very end, you can see the variation in the design variables. For example, the 10th thickness is now 0.237 units of length. Uh, the first thickness is now 0.097 units of length. And now let's go ahead and import the new results to your post-processor and let's go ahead and talk about those results. Uh, first, let me go ahead and remove uh, my old results. And let me go ahead and attach uh, new results. In the folder where you perform your optimization is a new OP2 file. For you, it might be XDB or some other results file. This file includes results for the initial design so this was before I perform optimization, and it includes structural results for the new optimized design. So here I've gone ahead and imported the results. Let's go ahead and view the results uh, with the graph. So here, let me see how good I can do this here. You notice that I have a, rather we have two sets of results. This first set of results, uh, you'll notice that the marker at the end says, D0. D0 stands for the initial design. So that's what the first set of data represents. The second set of data, you'll notice it has a new marker called D11. D11 stands for the last design cycle. So here, the initial design cycle could be D0, and the last design cycle is D11. So here, D0 are the initial results, whereas D11 are the new optimized results. What I can do now is I can go ahead and create uh, two new graphs. So let's go ahead and do that right now. So let me go ahead and first uh, select all the results for the initial design. So here we have forcing frequencies 20 hertz through 199 hertz. Let's go ahead and plot this right now. So this is the starting uh, response, if you will, for the initial design. Let's go ahead and look at the new optimized design. So for this, let me go ahead and select uh, every result for D11, uh, forcing frequencies 20 through 199. Let me go ahead and change the curve so it's a dotted line this time. Uh, make sure you mark the checkbox for append curves in XY window just so you plot the same uh, curve to the same window rather. So here in red is the original response for displacement. Here in green is the new response. You can see that we actually uh, minimize the height of the curve. And this was done by minimizing the RSS or the root sum of squares value uh, for this type of response. Now let's go back and talk about the results a little further. Let me see what else is there to talk about here. Quick discussion regarding normalized constraints. Uh, remember that the one normalized constraint value we specified is for volume. Uh, but here you'll notice something uh, interesting. Here we have a negative value for volume, or rather a negative value for the normalized constraint value. What I want to say here is that this normalized constraint value section is not reporting actual values for the constraints. It's reporting normalized constraint values. So here it's not reporting 
volume in its original units of volume. Uh, what you can do to explore what these values actually mean, you can go back to the web app and click on results and then open the responses app. This will allow you to import the F06 file. The F06 file contains a list of all the responses that were used during your optimization. So the benefit of this is that you can use it to track down what value goes to what a normalized constraint value. So here, for example, a normalized constraint value is negative 0.001248. Here, if we look back at the table, we notice that this value in bold is that same value, negative 0.001248.4. And this is corresponding to the volume constraint. If you click on maximum constraint for each design cycle, you can then see which specific quantity is corresponding to each normalized constraint value. So here, let's go ahead and uh, have a quick exercise. Um, here, the first normalized constraint value is 0.001248. That corresponds to the first row. The second row is corresponding to negative 1.03. And this is corresponding to this value, negative 0.001203. So you can see each row now is corresponding to each point here. And this is where you can say, or rather, where you can see the actual value for the volume. Uh, here in the volume column, you see that the volume goes from 8 to 7.99, 7.99, and it stays at that value for each additional design cycle. Uh, one other thing I should notice. Uh, the optimizer will look at all of your constraints and whichever constraint has the the worst normalized constraint value that will be the dominating controlling constraint for that design cycle um, keep in mind that you may have specified both a lower and an upper bound constraint both the lower and the upper bound would have their own normalized constraint values so that's why you see to the right of the upper bound column, you see its own normalized constraint values. And then for the lower bound to the left, you also see its own respective normalized constraint values. Uh, other things you can do with this table, you can review the S0 objective, if you will. Uh, remember that, let me look at this for a moment. S0 RSSS. Let's go ahead and click some more information. Right. So remember what I said at the beginning regarding this. Let me see if I can find the one value. Oh, perfect. Here it is. So let me go back to the PowerPoint and make a discussion about uh, the subjective expression that we created. Remember that when we specified um, the objective, the objective was originally a collection of multiple points. And then we used the RSS option in the web app to say consolidate all these points into this expression so we have one singular term. So if you look back at the responses section, you notice that we have all of these terms for the displacement. Uh, here we have one for 20 hertz, 21 hertz, 22, 23, 24, 25, and so on and so on. You can see there are definitely a large number of these individual points. Uh, this is corresponding to each point on this curve. Now, what happened to that single value? That single value is now listed as a retained DRESP2. So here, after it's performed the RSS expression for each individual point, the RSS value was computed to be 15.198. And keep in mind uh, that number because you see that is the number that's reported on the objective plot. So here I'm looking at the RSS value for each design cycle. This is the same value that's uh, available in the objective plot. So here 
you can see that uh, it starts at 15.198, so that would be here. And then the next design cycle is 13.13, .13, so that's reported here, and so on and so on. So at the very end, we get 11.3. Uh, here, if I zoom out, that's what we get here. Uh, the reason I went over this table, it lets you interrogate your optimization. Sometimes you want to confirm you've properly configured your objective and constraints. Uh, sometimes you might want to relax the constraints um, just so it's easier for the optimizer to find an optimum solution. Um, you can do most of that through the responses tool. So now let's go ahead and talk about one last thing before we go ahead and close. Uh, here's just a quick reminder that we've achieved the objective. Uh, we wanted to minimize the RSS displacement value, so we went ahead and did that. Uh, we achieved the objective. Uh, here, note that the thicknesses are varying through the length of the, the plate, if you will. You can see that there is this uh, tapering effect if I zoom in. Now, one last thing before I close. This PDF file that we started off with has old information in it. Uh, the thicknesses for the P-shell or properties are outdated. Uh, we started with thicknesses of 0 0.08. Uh, these are the same thicknesses that were reported in the plots. Here you can see that each thickness started at a value of 0 0.08. We have to now update these values to the new optimized values of 0 0.237, 0 0.163, and so on and so on. So how do we do that? Let's go ahead and close this and create a new copy called updated and I'll move it to the right. This file, as you can expect, uh, will have the updated thicknesses. So let's go ahead and look at the P shell entries. So these have to be updated. To do this, let's go ahead and open the directory where we perform the optimization and let's open the PCH file. This PCH file has the same P shell entries, P shell 1 through 10. So here we have uh, 1 through 10. But notice that the thicknesses have been updated to match the new optimized thicknesses. Uh, this is a capability in Nastran that produces this for you. Uh, the benefit to us is that we can simply go to the right, we can delete these old P shell entries. We can then go ahead and manually move over the ones from the left and move them to the ones on the right. And there we have it. Uh, the next thing I can do is save this file. And there we have it. This BDF file on your desktop now has the updated parameters. And that was essentially the last thing for this tutorial I wanted to leave you off with. Um, let me go ahead and uh, offer some final thoughts. If you are a professional engineer again, uh, and you have questions regarding Nastran Solution 200 training, uh, feel free to contact me at this email address and I would definitely get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, if you're a student, if you're an engineer and you would like access to the Nastran Solution 200 web app, you can also contact me at this email address and I will work with you to get you that access. With that, thank you so much for watching.